when when a musician knows what they have and it's not all just razzle dazzle and uh, come a day where they don't have that razzle dazzle but they could still move people because they're relying on who they are mm-hmm. and yeah, they may not do all the crazy shit manure and uh, but they still touch people and sometimes they touch people even more because they they got back to the basics and that basics is who you are warning this episode contains adult language and adult humor since when have trumpet players ever been considered adults if you are easily offended by these types of conversations consider switching to the oboe welcome to the trumpet guru zane podcast i'm your host jose johnson my guest for this episode is harry kim harry kim has such an extensive career that our hang needed two full episodes In part one, Harry talked about his musical relationship with Phil Collins, playing on some of the world's biggest stages, why you don't always have to try to fit in, and how Sarah Grapes have helped him make it through the tough times, and so much more. In part two, we'll dive even deeper into the heart and mind of this soulful musician. So, pour yourself a big glass, pull up a chair, and let the hang begin! So uh, when I when I can look back now and go, you know, hey, I was sweating all of this stuff that in the grand scheme of things really didn't mean anything. So uh, and, you know, uh, I've gone, you know, I have, like you, you know, I definitely have my, my share of, uh, of hardships and, and everything that that's come before this has just helped me to be a better version of who I am today. Yeah. Um, I think there's there's cer- certain people that have um, that kind of wisdom built in. I go back, you know, go back to my early days, everything that happened to me, I didn't sweat it. You know, uh, I just kind of lived moment to moment, day by day. And, um, you know, just doors kept opening for me. Mm -hmm. Some of them slammed in my face and uh, sour grapes. Sour grapes. You You move on. And uh, and I think the wisdom behind that, if you think about it, is uh, when you have that attitude, it doesn't affect you for the next thing that opens up for you. Right. You don't bring that fear. You don't. You're not full of baggage, as mm-hmm. they say. You know. So I think that recovering from defeats. Oh gosh, I remember. Uh, when I did my first gig with Phil Collins, the opening tune uh, was pretty hard. A song called Hand in Hand. And I was trying to be perfect every single performance. And I found that uh, I'd crack a note here or there. And and I would just really, I, I went on a head trip, you know, for the rest of the tune. And that year... We were we were playing in London, and they had the Winter Olympics on, and I saw people in the figure skating thing take a huge tumble right at the beginning, and then I said to myself, "How do they do the rest of their routine?" And they recover beautifully, and I remember saying, "I said that's what I got to do. Just to- totally forget about the mistake I just made." You know, and just, you know, it's it's about staying in the moment. Mm-hmm. You know, forget about what just happened. And, you know, especially because you've got the commentator say, oh, she's got a big uh, triple this and double whatever and coming up. And she stumbled on it at, 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 their, at her warm up. How is she going to do it? And then she does it because she's not thinking about that she stumbled. And when it comes up, she's practiced that so many times. She's not sweating it when it comes up. Right. And I kind of applied that to, to performance. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not the end of the world if you stumble a little bit here. Just don't let it affect the rest of your show, yeah. uh, of your routine or your recital. And the only way to do that is just stay in the moment. Don't think ahead. Oh, the, here comes the hard part coming up. No, the, that's destruction, self-destruction. You know, just... He practiced enough, you know, throughout the whole time preparing for this. Right. 
make it happen automatically. Mm -hmm. But if you think too much about it, it ain't going to happen. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you look at anybody who's, uh, you know, at the top of the, uh, the top of, of their craft, whether it be in music or anything. Like that, yeah. And I was, I usually default to sports because that's, that's a wonderful analogy. And it's something that people can, can usually look at unless you're a sports person, you know, then, then it's, it's your, your bed that you're, you're talking about to begin with. But if you look at it, you know, somebody like a LeBron James or, you know, Michael Jordan, um, you know, greats, you know, uh, Tom Brady, you know, anybody who, who is in that upper echelon of their sport, they make mistakes. You know, Brady will throw a pick, you know, Jordan would miss a, a shot, you know, LeBron will miss a shot, but you can get, you can be guaranteed that the next time they have the ball in their hands, they're not worried about what happened prior. They're just worried about executing that moment. And, and a lot of times what you don't want is you don't want those guys to make a few mistakes because they get so pissed off at themselves that they're just like, I'm dominating. And they get, they get into that other space. And I mm -hmm. think sometimes as musicians, that's what we tend to do is we get, you know, most of us, you know, we'll have that one clam or that one crack. And it's like the rest of the gig is shot because we're beating ourselves up for something that. 99.9% .9 of the people in the audience aren't going to remember. And, exactly. you know, and instead of just getting in it, get on it. And then just the same, you know, I'm just going to be in the moment and I'm going to destroy it from here on out. That's I tell, tell it to myself all the time. I remember uh, after the tsunami, I was asked to do a performance with an orchestra that was comprised of, um, Musicians from this conservatory, which is downtown, which is related to the L.A. Phil. So half the orchestra was the L.A. Phil. Half the orchestra was students from the conservatory. And I really had no business doing that. You know, I hadn't played. And it was Beethoven's night, the whole thing. And, you know, I'm convinced that Beethoven and the guys of that era were the, were the pioneers you know, had they written that now, they would have notated that stuff way differently, you know. <laughs> I'm convinced of that, you know. And there was this one part. There was a trumpet fanfare at a slow tempo, but it was written in 16th or something. So my mind played it double time, mm -hmm. you know, like, Da, 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 but it was a dun, da, dun, da, you know, and I, I, that was big. It was a big trumpet thing, and I remember dwelling on that for several days, and thinking, at one point, I'm the only one thinking about that at this moment. <laughs> Nobody else is thinking about that except me, and I'm beating myself up for it. So you learn from your mistake and you move on. It's not the end of the world, but I still hold that theory. Those guys were the pioneers and all that stuff would be notated differently. I, I understand there were rules as to how an andante is supposed to be written and an allegro and all that. But now nah, you get a guy write it today. It would be really easy to follow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh man. Don't, don't get me started on notation, especially on horn charts, horn charts oh, written uh, by keyboard then, players. You know, I hadn't played an orchestra, a real orchestra in so many years. And, you know, counting odd number of bars and lots of them. And then you start seeing cues. You know, now I, I studied my part. You know, a melody written, the oboe is playing, and then the flute plays it. And then, you know, but you just seeing this melody on a cue and you go, all right, which one is this one now? And <laughs> I'm staying with funk music. It's easy. To, you got a backbeat. As long as you're in two and four, you're cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just yeah, just, just put down, put down bridge. I can follow that. You know. Yeah, yeah. No, but it, that you know, it, it, I always say you do best what you do most. Mm. And I haven't played in orchestras. I mean, real orchestras since in my twenties, which was only a couple of years ago. But uh, <laughs> uh, it's a whole different bag. Yeah. Stay focused and all that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't have to stay focused uh, when you play what I do. You just got to stay engaged. Yeah, it's a difference between staying focused and staying engaged. And I, I find that after doing what I do for so long, 
it's hard for me to stay in focus, you know, because everything I do is kind of instinctive. Mm-hmm. I kind of know when I'm supposed to come in, If even if I'm playing in a big band, because the drummer sets it up. If I have a doubt, you know, I don't have to doubt because a good drummer will set it up and you know you're coming in the next bar. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it, it's kind of a weird thing. Yeah. But, uh, you know, fear is one of the things that, um, and nervousness is one of the things that affect musicians a lot. I get that a lot. Do you get nervous when you're on a big stage? No. What do you ner- What would you be nervous about? You know, and I, I think of... Um, I think of that movie, uh, Black Swan. Have you seen that? Yeah, you know, I've never it? seen that. Ah, it's it's a psychological thriller. It's like just really, uh, it's really a, a weird story, but it's one of those that'll stay with you for days and days. Mm-hmm. You know, the lead character, uh, she wants to play, you know, both parts in Swan Lake, you know, and she's having trouble with the, the Black Swan part because... It's, you know, she's trying to bring this out of her personality and she's working real hard, rehearsing real hard and stuff. And the choreographer asks her, why, why are you working so hard? She goes, because I want to be perfect. And, and he says to her, and this is something I quote now a lot because I feel that way. He goes, being perfect is letting go. So you practice, you practice, you practice. But when you get to that point of performance, you got to let go. You got to let go. And that's the one where everybody goes, wow, what a great performance that was. And not compare yourself to other people who played the same piece or anything. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, just that you're going to let go. And hopefully your individual, unique personality will shine through it. And people will say, that was really good. Yeah, that was really good because you touch people. Yeah, and I mean, when you get to a certain level, everybody's great. You yeah. Know? Oh yeah, you're you're you know you're you're in the the big leagues. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I had an interesting conversation uh, on a previous episode with uh, New York based uh, trumpeter uh, Kiku Collins. Uh, Kiku played with uh, uh, Beyonce, and you know, um, Gloria Gaynor. Yeah, and Gloria Gaynor. Yeah, and uh, we were we were talking about a little bit about our career and I was asking her about, you know, being on, on the big stage and stuff like that. And she's like, you know, I have zero fear on the big stage. She said, but I'm terrified in a small club because I can mm. see people. You know, she's like, you know, if I'm playing in a, in a, in a big Coliseum, you, you really can't even see the people in the front row because of all the, the lights and stuff like that. So she said, I'm, I'm just kind of, I'm I'm just playing and and I can't be distracted by by other people. If I'm playing in a small club and I see somebody, you know, like looking at their watch or you know something like that, you know, then then it it starts to get in your head. So, it's real interesting how some people have that um have the fear of the large crowd. Those like people hate public speaking. Uh you know, people some people have a fear of intimacy, so they have problems with smaller spaces. Um so it, it's kind of interesting how the psychology comes into play and, and you have to kind of find your you have to find your groove you know and what what works works best with you but I think sometimes the the problem particularly in, in the performing world is that you know people aren't happy with the space that they're in so uh you know you you have people like well you know oh man I you know I would be so happy if I had a, a gig like Harry's and and you know I'm touring the world and I'm playing these large stages and these big productions and and blah 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 without thinking about the the demands of that job because there's a there's a different level of uh of intensity in terms of rehearsal schedules, travel schedules, you know, production and things like that. There, it's it's different doing that than just walking into a bar and playing, you know, two or three sets. Um, and you have to have a personality that is going to allow you to do that uh, without having that that level of undue stress. Um, so, you know, having been in the in the business so long, especially playing, you know, the type of music you play. Uh, what's the advice that, that you've had to give people uh, in terms of how to navigate this this world of, uh, for lack of a better word, high profile profile gigs? Uh, you know, what what kind of advice do you say? You know, do these are the things you really need to make sure you're on your game on, and this is the, the stuff you can just kind of chill out on. 
Well, it all has to do with confidence. You know, feeling good on your instrument. So that means that uh, you spend enough time doing maintenance and warming up, even on days off, uh, so that you could reach hit the stage with confidence that you know your chops are going to be working. Uh, the other part of it is being confident in who you are and know you're going to go out there and, and you look forward. You know, I'm not an egomaniac or anything, but, you know, like when I invite people to the concerts and stuff, me that wait till you see this you know wait till you hear what we're doing you know it's confidence um uh, so the the there's no fear the only time i've had fear is when my chops aren't feeling good when i'm going through changes with my chops and then i get what they call the flop sweats you know that's the rodney dangerfield thing yeah. where he starts sweating and that comes from uh playing in a club and and bombing you know, so he, he created this flop sweats thing. And I've experienced that, you know, I'm playing something and I know I'm not going to make it to the end or I'm soloing it and my chops aren't working and I'm going to play something less the dy less dynamic than I intend to. And I start sweating like crazy. And I know that, uh, you know, if your chops are good, you have confidence. And if what you're playing is good, you have confidence. And, and if you know what you're doing, is uh, is validated by everybody around you. You know you have you get have confidence, and and if you're engaged, I use that word a lot because you know a lot of people think that that all the stuff you do is is just show you know, but no, the show aspect of it it won't be convincing if you're not engaged. You can't fake that stuff, you know, and then having confidence what what you. I remember uh, Celine Dion uh, in an interview, they were talking about chops and she said it's really funny because during those performances where she has the flu or a cold or something like that, always, without a doubt, that's when people come out and say, I've never heard you sing that good. It was so touching. It was you know, and they asked her, why do you think that is? And she said, I think it's because I knew I couldn't rely on tricks and chops. I had to be myself with what I had. And that's interesting because, uh, you know, when, when a musician knows what they have and it's not all just razzle dazzle and uh, come a day where they don't have that razzle dazzle, but they could still move people because they're relying on who they are. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they may not do all the crazy shit manure and, uh, but they still touch people. And sometimes they touch people even more because they, they got back to the basics and that basics is who you are, yeah. you know, what it was when you learned the first song you know you didn't try to play a lot of razzle dazzle you played the melody the way you felt it and and that convinces people so you know there's a lot of ways to look at it you could be very confident with your pyrotechnics uh is that a correct word that's yeah. that's a correct word but there's got to be a time when you're very confident about who you are and what you convey in music and uh and that would be passion and sincerity because people could tell when you're trying to fool them you know and there's a lot of renowned artists out there that i go eh, he, it, it, that's an act mm -hmm. you know and, you know passion is, is is really important and passion uh, is important in in relationships you know whether they be friends or lovers, but to be passionate about what you talk about, about how you deal with life together and, and stuff, that, that's that's really important. Yeah. And I don't think that um, that people should block, put a wall up, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be good friends, but not that good. 
you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be expressive, but not that expressive. You know, I, I know plenty of people that there are certain things they won't talk about, even in the most, I will say intimate, not physically, mm-hmm. but in yeah. the most intimate friendship moments, mm-hmm. they draw a line. Yeah. I ain't going there. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not going to tell you what I really feel mm-hmm. and all this stuff. So that, that kind of puts a damper. Uh, I, f- I find that my best friends completely put their guard down when, they, when, when we talk. And that also affects me because then I can put my guard down too. And then we can have a really passionate talk. Right. Music is the same way. I mean, if you walk in somewhere intimidated, you're not going to give it your best. Uh, and if you want to be the intimidator, uh, it, it's all show. Yeah. Well, it's got to be real sincere. It's like, you know, these legendary meetings of great jazz musicians you hear about and, and the humility that everybody had. Uh, towards each other, you know, you didn't have, you know, except well, a few exceptions, but you didn't have a lot of attitudes. You know, everybody was doing their best. Mm-hmm. I like trumpet players. I can name a few who are just gifted, but they know how hard it is for other people. Mm-hmm. And they don't, they never rise themselves they never put themselves above those those are people with humility yeah and you can actually have good discussions with them i learned a lot there's a trumpet player named dave trigg yeah. who's a just a gifted trumpet player able to do things and he never puts anybody down who's trying to play the trumpet you know and and we've had great discussions where he he talks about what he feels when he's doing certain things, and and uh, I learned a lot from him, yeah. you know, about blowing. I, I've never become the high note star that he is, but uh, I learned a lot about overall playing yeah. just from hearing him talk sincerely about what he feels and what he thinks about when he's playing. Yeah, and. Uh, you know, and then I know guys that uh, will judge you as a person according to how good you play. Yeah. And I've always found that, you know, off-putting because, you know, so you run into a trumpet player who is not that good. You don't sign off on him as a person. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, so it depends on different individual state of mind and their, what they need to uh, complement their own egos and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I feel that I'm really grounded because um, I grew up very poor. Mm-hmm. You know, I grew up in the ghetto in, in New York, Lower East Side of Manhattan. Uh, I know what that's like. And I'm not one of these guys that uh, I'm on the world stage and I, and I put people down if they live like that still. I came from there and I know I know I could easily, well, I'll give you an example. When when my after my wife passed away, I I had zero dollars in the bank because spent it all on on uh, medical bills and surgeries and this and that. And and the thought of having to sell my house was my plan B. I'm gonna be fine. I have no money, but I could always sell my house. I have equity. Mm-hmm. Uh, for somebody else, that would be devastating to be homeless. But I didn't have a house when I was born. You know, I had nothing when I was growing up, you mm-hmm. know. Uh, so it it wasn't that devastating. The house doesn't define me. Right. You know, what defines me, I think, is my ability to survive. And if, if I had to, I would sell the house. And I'd have money in the bank and I'd be have some peace of mind, you know. And, uh, but it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Uh, Maybe because, you know, if you want to be metaphysical about it, my, I was calm about it. And eh, if I lose the house, I lose the house. Yeah. But I didn't lose the house, you know? And then the next thing that happened was a three year tour at Phil Collins and bam, I'm back in the game again. And, uh, I think about this a lot of times because I get young people you know, they're worried about their careers. They're worried about the future. And I tell I never worried about anything. You just do what you're doing. It's going to work out one way or another. It's going to work out, you know, 
and just just live your your dreams, live your your life without fear and this constant pressure about the future. I never wondered if I was going to make it as a musician. And it went, you know, in retrospect, because I was just living the life of a musician at an early age, you know, uh, never worried about it too much. Uh, there was one time in my life, I don't know, maybe I'm getting too personal here, but I, I had a girlfriend that left me because she'd rather had been uh, dating uh, a CEO, a corporate guy. Mm -hmm. And I remember when she left, she said that I wasn't ambitious enough for her. Like wanting to be a musician wasn't ambitious enough for her. So I went through a little thing about that because I had a tour and I ran into a couple of high school buddies. And this I was in my early 30s, I remember. And uh, they had good jobs. They bought houses. They were married. They had children. And they were the same age as I as I was, and mm -hmm. I, was, I don't have shit to show for, for what I've been doing, and along with that that uh, disappointing heartbreak. I mean, she was just cold. You're not ambitious enough for me. And uh, I remember talking to a friend of mine's uh, personal assistant because she knew my girlfriend. She goes, oh, "That's." You know, uh, choosing the right partner is a career move. You got to understand that, you know, and you that career move. And I was thinking, God, what am I going to do? Because I, I don't see that this is going to change very much. The music business was like really took a dump in 1980. Right. And uh, so I was doing different kinds of work than I was in the 70s. And that thought lasted about three months and I stopped worrying about it. And things just started sailing. And, uh, I didn't have to worry about it. Turns out, even for those three months, those three months are a waste of time. So I tell people, don't waste your time thinking about it. Just do it. Yeah. Do it. It's all a state of mind. Are you going to wonder if, uh, if you'll ever be a musician? Be a musician. Put yourself in a state of mind of being a musician. Get out of the the student state of mind. Because mm -hmm. even when I was, I thought of myself as a musician and that put me in, in situations where I was working, you know, so that gave me a, a feeling of validation that I am a musician. I'm just not as good as others, but I'm a working musician. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to wonder what the future is like. The future is not in your hands. Just the only thing that's in your hands is what you do right now. And um, so I tell people, stop stressing. Jeez, too much stressing. I think the system, you know, the stress, the kind of stress that parents put kids in, getting into good colleges and this and that and the other thing. Uh, I think that's uh, too much stress and not being able to live the moment. Yeah. So I, I've always been under the uh, impression, because I didn't go to college or anything, but to go to, to a college and spend whatever it is, 50000 a year to be a performance major, I just thought that was a waste of time. Why are you doing that? Get, get out and start yeah. working. Yeah, that's, that's a bad I, business I investment. I find that a lot of musicians come out of college and gig yet. You know, of course, things are different now than they were when I was a kid, but I'm sure you could find an opportunity to work. Now, I've talked to a couple of guys that came out of college and we were successful. And I said, why is that? Because they agreed with me. It's kind of a waste of money. If you're the type of student that's going to network and meet people while you're in college, you get out of college and you start working. But if you're the kind of the loner type and don't make a lot of friends, it is a waste of time. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a waste of time because all these guys – uh, that did that, they came out of college and they they reached out to the people they met during those years in college. Um, you know, the contractors, uh, this, that, you know, and the other thing, and musicians from the LA Phil or something like that, and 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 immediately got a spot subbing on the on the in the orchestra, and and, and those are people good people skills, right? You know. 
But if you don't have it, uh, they agree it's kind of a waste of time, a yeah. waste of money. Yeah. Um, so uh, when I do lectures, I tell people, no matter what university you're in, and and make the time to put a band together. All you have, all you need to do is you know get a list of 15 songs you want to learn how to play. You know, the horn player, the horn can learn how to write horn arrangements. You know, the band leader will learn to organize. You know, somebody else will learn business skills. There's got to be a bar in the town you live in that'll hire a band uh, once a month. You know, you go play there, you play for the door whatever, but you get so much out of it, the experience you can get out of it. Instead of taking your time off to, you know, for your social life, you know, this might show you how much determination you have uh, to put a band together. I may be talking out of reality because I don't know what college life is like, but I sure as hell, if I was in college, that's what I would do. I'd put a band together, you know, find the right singer, find the right horn players and rhythm players, uh, gets you know assign things. If I didn't write the charts myself, I'd get people to write charts and somebody to go to a club and book it and whatever. One Monday a month. Yeah, that's all it takes. Yeah, you know you rehearse a few times a week and get those fifteen tunes down. Uh, I encourage that because yeah. that's real life experience. Exactly. You know? Exactly. As you know, the, the the symphonic players they go to their rehearsals, their orchestra rehearsals, mm -hmm. and all that, and they get their experience that way. You know, the jazz player that goes to jam sessions. If you're if you lean towards wanting to play other kinds of music other than that, uh, do it. Yeah, you know, you, there's so much music to choose from. You could do funk, you could do rock and roll, you could do blue eyed rock. You know, yeah, uh, all, all kinds of stuff, and uh, that would be exciting for an audience to hear. Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah. You know, so I, I really, uh, I really believe that uh, if you're determined, you could do stuff. Yeah. I remember reading once um, a, um, the single most identifying factor if a child is going to be successful has nothing to do with IQs or test scores. It has to do with what's the word they used? Um, grit. Mm -hmm. curiosity and determination you find a kid who does that he's going to be successful yeah who has that i should say has I, those qualities yeah. and he's going to be successful i agree a hundred percent on that all right well, well harry we uh we've got two segments i got to get through and i know we we've been we've been talking a lot about a lot of stuff and man we we we're gonna have to, to schedule like episode two, three, and four, <laughs> because man, you've got some great insights. I'm, I'm just loving this, but I, I got to get to these two segments before I can let you go. Uh, the first one is the obligatory discussion of gear. Uh, we got to do it. It's trumpet talk, but I don't want to just talk about, Hey, what, what trumpet do you play? What mouthpiece play, but mostly about the role that gear plays, you know, the decisions uh, that you make in, in regards to gear, especially for someone who's playing, you know, primarily commercial and, and these kind of, uh, uh, larger gigs. So, uh, Tell us a little bit about your setup. Well, my philosophy is way different from most trumpet players. I feel that um, I pick equipment that makes it easy to play. Because the easier time I have at playing, the more I'll be able to do stuff. Sound... Uh, is important, but you can search for sound while you're searching for ease. So I actually went down and back up uh, a rabbit hole <laughs> of mouthpieces. Um, I decided to make some big changes only because uh, I play a CG bench and I've been searching for a good CG bench for, for about four years and uh, bought a few and they, they were not good. They, they weren't, they had problems with intonation, with this and that and the other thing. So I just stumbled on one last year, uh, just out of luck, stumbled on one that's really good, easy to play, 
And then I decided that it's time to go down the mouthpiece rabbit hole. I haven't changed mouthpieces so many years. I know his grit. I know that there's something better. You know, the curiosity. Let me start trying and not giving up. You know, I stayed with home base. I don't destroy that because I always know I could come back to it. But I went to Bob Reeves and I tried every mouthpiece he has, every, you know, cup, every backboard, everything. And, uh, and then uh, I was able to pinpoint um, something that helped me. So I had never tried his ES. I always felt it was shallow. But I also learned in my, you know, and for the stuff I play, I wouldn't use an ES for, you know, orchestral thing or anything. But I, I always found that it was too shallow. But I decided to open up the hole, the drill size, because I noticed that sometimes things feel shallow because the air is not quite going through it. You know, so it, it gives you the illusion that it's too shallow, but it's not. It's the air kind of backing up. So I opened up the hole, and that made a huge difference. Uh, and then I said, still not comfortable. So I had him one using my rim, the rim I've been playing for 15 years. So he, he made one, and then I started messing with the backboards. Uh, the first backboards uh, you make, uh, the standard backboard is what he calls the number two. And I felt it was too tight. So then I got, I had another one made with a six, nine backboard, which is a little bit bigger. And uh, it didn't feel right. I can't tell you if it was too tight or too open or what. And then, so I started experimenting. And you gotta have dollars to do this. <laughs> and you gotta also know what you need. So what I did was, I had one made with a 6.9 backbore and a little bit of the two, so which made it a 6.92, which is a wide open backbore, but not quite as wide because the two didn't, the two cutter didn't go all the way. Mm -hmm. Am I boring you with this? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm good. Right. And then I also started with a, a standard two backbore and just sticking the 6.9 in there a little bit. So they're, both a 692, a minus 692, but at different degrees, because I started with uh, two different. One, I started with the 69, and then one, I started with uh, the two. Because mm -hmm. um, I knew the, the full blown 692 wasn't working with my horn, it, it was too wide open. So I knew there was something in there. So I just kind of found one. The one I play is what is it? can't see okay this one this one started as a two and then stuck the six nine cutter in there a little a little bit just a it, well it took out a, a good amount of it didn't it just didn't, didn't right. go all the way right so you know this is labeled minus six nine two and that has been my secret mouthpiece now for about three months. Mm -hmm. So I was able to climb out of the rabbit hole. And I'm really happy. I took this on a test drive on several gigs, uh, several hard-blowing gigs. I took a, a few salsa gigs uh, recently and, and went out and sat in with salsa bands. Because for me, that's the best test. But you don't have monitors. Uh, you're just blowing. And, and you, you just see... And uh, where it's going to take you. And I'm really happy with the sound. It's big. And yet it still has the edge to cut through. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I have an abundance of freedom with this horn, which happens to be a good CG bench. Um, I think that a lot of the CG benches have been tampered with. That's why uh, I haven't been able to run in one, mm -hmm. into one for a long time, mm -hmm. for years. Uh, but this one is like, whoa. And as a matter of fact, the guy I bought this one from is a music store. 
in Atlanta called, I oh, can't remember, Rich something. Anyway, he had another one, a CG bench in mint condition that was in somebody's closet. And he sent it to me also. And it was like, eh, it wasn't as good as this one. Yeah. So I got the horn. I got the mouthpiece to match it. Uh, it, it, it I'm new again. And uh, there's a whole history behind this thing that I won't get into. But I had a really good CG bench in 2012. that I And I fell down some stairs during a rehearsal. And I smashed it. Hmm. And I was never able to get it to play good again. Tried three different bells. It didn't work. And then my wife got sick. And then yeah. she ultimately passed away. I stopped bothering with that. I wasn't practicing and all that stuff that I went through. So it was time to get back into the searching yeah. and i'm glad i did because whew, i got some good results ah good that's what i like to hear and and some good tips there for people you know as they're uh they're thinking about the the way they want to approach their gear there's some good tips in there to uh you know let the ease of the playing steer the ship man because well, i'll tell you it's really simple you have to be very systematic about it you know if i have 15 mouthpieces in front of me you know, I'll play exactly the same thing on each one of them. And that's like a two octave or or even sometimes a three octave scale from low G to high, you know, G above the staff, or just from F in the staff to the F above the staff, and then maybe go chromatic to the F sharp and then the G, you know. But I'll do the, exactly the same thing with each mouthpiece. And most of them won't work or doesn't sound as good, or is not easier, or is not better, mm -hmm. put that aside, put that aside. And then I'll run into one that it does help. So I'll put that somewhere else. And then I'll just run until I maybe, maybe have just one, or I might have two. And then I start testing different things. And for me, for the kind of music I play, uh, being able to articulate notes, that, 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 you know, do things like that, but exactly the same with each one. And one will fizzle out and one won't. And uh, and then I stay with that one. And then I start thinking, well, what if this is the grid? Yeah. What if I open the hole? What if I change the back? Or what if I do this and that? And ultimately, it led me to what if I use my rim? You know? Yeah. And then sleeves is another another story yeah 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 because you know, i i have sleeves in quarter sizes starting from four four and a quarter four and a half four and three quarters and i will try every single one of them you know and try specific things and i will find one that is better than the other and then i go back to it a week later and try them again and no the one i chose was was the best or, or most efficient i should say yeah so um that's that that's super that's super all right well we got one final segment to go through this is the quickest one ever this is called the robinson's remedy rapid fire round brought to us by our good friends at robinson's remedies products for your lips uh this is a series of questions that go all over the place well, who is this guy robinson's remedies ken robinson a uh, great player from uh the detroit area uh so his, uh, he has his lip repair and lip renew and uh, actually started his product line uh, to, to deal with cold sores. And uh, a lot of a lot of guys really like it for uh, for just so keeping if I, an, if I answer these questions, does he send me free samples? I will send you free samples if you answer these questions and some, <laughs> and some manure. So some fresh manure from here in Lancaster County. <laughs> All right. So here he came. Here we go. Our Robinson's Remedy Rapid Fire Round. First question for you. Who's the biggest influence on your life that is not a trumpet player? That is not a trumpet player. Yeah. Oh. Oh. I've only known trumpet players my whole life. <laughs> Man, my I feel father. sorry for you. My father. Your father. My okay. Brother. Cool. Uh, what's your favorite book? Oh, I've only read a few books. I must admit that I... I have ADD, and reading has always been difficult for me. But I've only read a few books, and let me think uh, which one was. I read the biography on Satchmo. Yeah, that's a good that one. Was yeah. Uh, what's the worst movie you've ever seen? 
I always joke about this with my son because we started watching this, a movie called The Cabin. Whew. I don't think we could sit through a first half hour. It was terrible. The acting was terrible. The story was terrible. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, it's make... supposed to be a horror movie. Okay. You know? All right. Um, if you weren't a trumpet player, what would you want to be? A chef. Ah, uh, that seems to be a popular answer with trumpet players. I don't know why. Um, because, you know, it takes a lot to prepare to be a trumpet player. And cooking is, so, you know, you, you, you chop this, you chop that, and you have everything prepared, all the ingredients. And it's just a matter of psh, 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 just adding it in, and then uh, you got a meal. And then also, also, it has to do with envisioning what you want to eat, what you want to taste and create. Without a recipe, you know it needs this, it needs that. And trumpet playing is that way, you know. Uh, I mean, looking for a mouthpiece, yeah. forget about it. <laughs> I, I thought it was all about the sizzle or something like that. Uh, nah, it, nah, it has to do with the working real hard over a hot fire. Yeah. That's for sure. All right. What's your favorite drink? Diet Coke. Ooh. Okay. That's terrible, I know. I'm yeah. trying to get rid of it. Mm. Very bad. But yeah. you talking alcoholic? I'm talking any kind of drink. I'll I'll drink uh, I'll drink good diet cokes more often than not. Even though I try to get away from it, I I I, uh, I need the the fizz. I I crave the fizz. Uh, I don't want the sugar. I feel guilty about the sugar, but what's in it is worse. So yeah, yeah you got the fizz. All right, uh, you could have a dinner party. And invite any three living people, any three people in the entire world could come to this party. Uh, who would you living invite? Living or dead? Uh, living. Oh, okay. Any three living people. Well, I would invite my friend Kurt, my best friend Kurt. I would invite uh, this lady that I'm dating right now. And I would probably invite my next door neighbors. Wow. Okay. Keeping it close to home. I like that. Uh, you've got three additional chairs at this table, and you can invite any three people from history. So any three people that are no longer with us. Ooh. I'd like, um, and I can't think of his name now, the great author uh, Baldwin. Mm -hmm. Can't remember his first name. You remember his first name? Not Alec Baldwin. No, no. that's an actor. No. Um, well, let's see. Ask the question again. Any three people from history can attend your dinner party. Okay. I've met this guy several times, and he he was so much fun. Living or dead, right? These are dead people. Uh, uh, Robin Williams. Okay. Uh so much fun. This is supposed to be rapid fire, aren't they? You know what the problem is? What's the problem? I know so many people. Ah. You know, you know, they talk about 60 degrees of separation. Mm -hmm. I think I know everybody on earth in one degree. You know. Yeah. Um, so this makes it well, difficult. We, we, oh, we, we, was that? Obama. Well, Obama's alive. Obama. So, Obama. you know, so. So we can go back and you know you don't have to stay in the in the in the modern era. I mean, you can go. Wouldn't, wouldn't you want to have somebody like you know Socrates or? Uh, oh no, Plato? too much thinking. Oh, too much thinking. Okay. Uh, besides that, you could read all this his manure. You anyway, read all his manure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, these are people that I know. I'm gonna have fun jamming with. You know? uh, and I mean, in banter. Right. You know, Anthony Bourdain. Mm, okay. You know, it, it's, it'll be a fascinating evening. And now I'm picking people that would probably be, you know, uh, complimentary to each other. Mm -hmm. Although Robin Williams would probably tell jokes for two hours and nobody would be able to get a word in. Right. But, but no, I, I've run into him several times and, and he was on stage all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, once he ran into somebody he could uh, talk to, I see his wife. Find a place to sit because he, he, she knew he was going to spend an hour 
making them laugh. Mm -hmm. So maybe he wouldn't be the right guy for Obama and Bourdain. Uh, you know, Edgar Allan Poe might be cool. Okay. You know. Well, got, a, got an interesting mix there. All right, next yeah. question. Lacquer plated or raw? Uh, silver. Silver plated. Okay. What's your favorite? What? Well, what's that? Depends on the horn. Okay. But silver plating on a CG bench for sure. All right. Good enough. Uh, what's your favorite quote? Oh, I have lots. I think Maya Angelou. Angelou. At the end, people won't remember what you did or what you said, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Mm. I love that. Yeah, that's a great one. Uh, what's your greatest fear? Definitely um, heights. Okay. But only, only to a certain degree. Like, I can look out of a plane, uh, airplane window looks like a painting. It doesn't bother me. I could be on top of the Eiffel Tower. looks like a painting. It doesn't bother me. But put me on the fourth floor or the 19th floor of a hotel balcony. Ooh. That's a you different know, As soon as I have perspective, if I see a treetop or a telephone pole and I could see how low it is and how far the drop is, I have to go in. Okay. All right. We know that now. Um, you could be granted one superpower. What would it be? Ooh, if you would have asked me that at 10 years old, it would have been. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I can imagine either, either x-ray vision or invisibility. I know. Yeah. Oh, everybody, huh? Uh, -huh. uh healing, healing. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would love to be able to, to heal. I actually read a book, uh, by a Christian healer. And uh, it was too involved for me to attempt. You have to be anointed. You have to do this. You have to do that. And I, I'm too much of a renegade to become that uh, devout of mm -hmm. a Christian. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you on that. But yeah. Healing would be, ooh, yeah, people, that... people out of their illnesses and injuries mm -hmm. would be something. Yeah. That would be. You know what? This what? is related. Oh, no. We, uh, you don't want to huh. talk about it. You don't want me to talk about spirituality, do you? Uh, you it's it's your show, man. Uh, and, you know, I'm just a host. Uh, this, I don't know. I don't like to talk about this all the time because it might turn people off. But I've always felt that my trumpet is a vehicle for um, the Holy Spirit to speak through. And I always felt that it has somehow the ability to heal. Not me. Mm -hmm. It's what I do with the trumpet. And that has been confirmed many times throughout my life where people said, your trumpet made me feel better. Your trumpet pulled me out of depression, you know, having heard me play. Your trumpet, uh, I came to this, to this gig uh, broken hearted because I just broke up with somebody and uh, your trumpet made me feel happiness again. Uh, so, you know, this may be too much for people to handle, but I really believe that um, if, you ha if you're open to it and you play the trumpet with all sincerity, not as a, a weapon, not as a tool to build yourself up, or to impress or anything, but just to play with all your heart. And you're also open to greater power than you. I really think that there are times, it's not always, but there are times when when I'm used as a vehicle for his power and and uh, it relates to the power of healing. Mm -hmm. I, um, I do believe that there is that effect. Mm -hmm. It's not that I want to. Mm -hmm. It's that it is, because yeah. it's been confirmed to me. People from out of nowhere, just out of left field, will tell me, when I heard you play the trumpet, I, I got a letter from somebody uh, uh, that was in a clinical depression. And this is kind of a long story, but, uh, you know, if you've ever heard the But Seriously album, mm -hmm. the first thing 
on that album is a trumpet fanfare that I wrote. And this woman says she was in a clinical depression for two years, and she got this CD, the But Seriously CD, for, for Christmas, and she never opened it up. And then it, this it was like springtime by then. She listened to it, and she said she, the trumpet fanfare in the first part of that CD was like a smack in her face. Uh, and woke her up out of her depression. She she was filled with motivation after she heard that. She wrote me a letter. She found me, you yeah. know, uh, to, to say that. You know, things like that, uh, I I guess I want to believe because mm -hmm. that's one of my superpowers that I want. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but um, to think that my trumpet playing is a little bit more significant than just making money and going out there and acting like a fool on stage. You know, if I could make somebody feel good for two hours or during a show or something like that, I think that's, that's kind of a goal I have all the time when I play. And, and I got to take my ego out of it. I got to play as, as sincerely and passionately as I can at that moment. Yeah. Well, and then the, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. In in you know there whether you want to think about it from the spiritual perspective or the scientific perspective, um, music has a healing quality to it, just in general. Uh, but when the music is fused with uh, that sincerity, that that love, that passion, that that honesty, uh, I think that's what really amplifies it. And you know uh, you know the. To me, music is, uh, it's obviously playing trumpets physical, uh, it's mental, it's emotional, it's spiritual, you know, it's all of those things when, when you're, when you're at, at, at the highest. But I think this, the, the emotional and the spiritual, to me, are the things that draw me to music. You know, it, it, it changes my emotions, it lifts my spirit, and uh, I know if I can do that for others, then I'm living up to my purpose. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm with you. I'm with you, man. Yeah. I mean, you hear about musicians talking about having out-of-body experiences. Boy, when everything is right, when trumpet playing becomes effortless and you're not playing notes, you're playing shapes, mm -hmm. and you have these out-of-body experiences where you're watching yourself and you go, dang! <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, sometimes yeah. I would like to get out of my body, but that's a different story. <laughs> uh. <laughs> All right. We got just a couple more questions, real quick ones. Uh, you can go back in time. Oh, no. I, got, I missed this one. Uh, what aspect of trumpet playing do you feel is the most overrated? Overrated? Um, you attract a lot of chicks. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> The percussionist does. Yeah, well. Yeah. Uh, what, what aspect do you think is the most underrated? The gratification that you get. It's just, like I said, it's like winning a Grand Slam. All right. It, people don't even know about it. Okay. All right. You, uh, you can go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice about music. What would it be? Go to college. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I would have spent more time on stuff that doesn't come natural to me. You okay. know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because I, I said, like I could tell the, I have ADD. I wish I would have sat down and woodshed it more on bebop. I just did stuff that was easy. Yeah. You know, that came natural. Yeah. But if I had to do it over again, I would become very proficient bebop player. Okay. Cause that that's a superpower I wish I had. Yeah. All right. And while you're back there, you're going to give your younger self one piece of advice about life. I, I already said that. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Don't worry about it, man. Gotcha. Don't worry about it. All right. Life is going to find a way whether you worry about it or not. All right. And you can't plan everything. You know, it just, it just goes a direction that it's going to go. And you just kind of fill it with stuff. All right. All right. And final question for you, Harry Kim. What do you want your legacy to be? 
Stu is a nice guy. I think that's most important of all. Yeah. You know, it's it's tied in with um that Maya Angelou quote. Mm-hmm. You know, I made people feel good. Yeah. So well, you know, and and you certainly have done that. Uh, I I certainly feel much better after our, our talk today. And oh, uh, you're not feeling well when uh, we no, start. Uh, no, uh, no, I'm I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> but, no, it's 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 great to talk to you. Great to get to know you. And you know, your music has certainly been uh, a source of source of joy and inspiration, and sometimes frustration for me as a trumpet player. But uh, I certainly appreciate everything you've done, uh, and will continue to do as a, a trumpet player, performer, a, an advocate, uh, and a, a source of healing in our world today. So thanks, Harry. Well, may I add something? Absolutely. I, uh, I'm, I'm elated now that this pandemic is, um, is uh, o- almost over. It depends on different parts of the country, whether the anti-vaxxers will create new shutdowns. But I just accepted a, a tour uh, with Tower of Power. Awesome. Which has got to be one of the most fun gigs for trumpet for me. Uh, I can't wait to get it. I, I, I worked with them uh, for about three weeks in the beginning of 2020. Maybe a little more than that. And, you know, I know I'm not jaded. Mm-hmm. When I get up there and I play that music, and I, I have to add this to the, you know, it was a last minute call to do it. Mm-hmm. And I didn't have time to look at the music or anything. So I pretty much sight read the show, you know, the first the first gig. Uh, and it, just to play that song, the, the music and know the songs and, and, and you know, I'm not jaded. Yeah. It's exciting. It is exciting to go out and play this music. I, I think I've reached a, a stage in my life that I choose to do things that I want to do and uh, later for the stuff I have to do. I don't, you know, boy, just go out with Tower Power, you know. So I will be in a town near you sometime within this whole, even the beginning of 2022. We're, we're, we're touring all over the place in the U.S. So keep an eye out for it. I'll keep an eye. Are you playing the uh, Are you are you playing the the lead book or the the second book? Yeah, the lead book. Okay. So is Adolfo still on the on the gig? Adolfo still on the Adolfo's gig. Adolfo's my boy. Adolfo's yeah. my boy. So Adolfo and I go back a few years. So uh, we're, is that right? If, if if you guys are close enough for me to get to a show, I guarantee you, I'll be there, and we are going to hang, my friend. Yeah, well, you know, keep your eye open on their on their website. Uh, anybody who's listening to this, too, you know, if we're playing in a, in a town near you, come out and see you and and introduce yourself, and and I'll be glad to sit with you and talk and flirt with your girlfriend. No, no, well, yeah, you know. <laughs> hey, I'm telling you, <laughs> but you know, yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, yeah, so. I'm looking forward to making new friends while I'm out there. It, it looks exciting, but most of all, you know, you talk about that Grand Slam thing. Mm-hmm. You walk off the stage from Tower of Power. Oh, yeah. And I will brag a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, somebody somebody brought this up. I didn't make this up. But uh, they were trying to um, impress people with my presence and said that I may be the only trumpet player on earth who has had the quadrifactor, quadrifacta of horn groups. You know, played with Phil Collins, Earth, Wind, and Fire, Chicago, and now Tower Power. So I, I feel, uh, I, I like to say that because it sounds good. <laughs> And uh, and I could always say that somebody else said it. It's not me. Yeah, yeah it wasn't you. It wasn't you. No, it wasn't me. Yeah. I'm just repeating it. Yeah. Well, but, it, the, the, but there's also the the feeling of accomplishment for me uh, that at my stage of the game, I could still handle 
one of the hardest sleep books out there because yeah. it's nonstop playing from the first note to the end. Yep. I can still handle that. Yeah. Well, Thanks to uh, Claude Gordon and all the other people that helped me learn how to play more efficiently. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, and a shout out to Bobby Shu, who was uh, uh, very important, gave me some important tips. He doesn't know it, but it opened up doors. A mm-hmm. uh, great trumpet player named John Madrid, mm-hmm. who opened uh, a, a ton of doors for me just, just by one thing they said. Dave Trigg, uh, Bobby Bryant, um, you know, these guys are important. Uh, Carmine Caruso, who I studied as a teen with as a teenager, whose uh, method meant nothing to me at the time, but it means everything now that I became a better trumpet player. It didn't help me become a better trumpet player, but it helps me now yeah. that I I've got it figured out. Yeah. So that's one of those things. So um, that's all. I just wanted to shine a shout out to you. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, my pleasure. And I, I certainly will be looking at that uh, TOP schedule and I will, I will track you down. I will track you down so I can uh, uh, give you your, uh, your bag of Amish shit. Uh, and uh, we can, uh, we can have a, a glass of uh, diet Pepsi together. Oh, wow. I, I might have a Bailey's ah, if you're right. I, I'll be yeah. okay. Uh, you know, Adolfo's, uh, Adolfo's a single malt guy, so uh, at least he, he was last time I hung with him. I so. too. Uh, uh, Lafroy, 10 year. Okay. All right. One you, of my favorites. Yeah. I'll, I'll buy the first round. You've got the next three. So uh, <laughs> thanks, we Harry. Won't be, we won't be drinking Lafroy for the next three. Yeah. <laughs> We'll, we'll be down to the Boone's Farm after that. Yeah. So uh, thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. And for all of you out there in Trumpet Guru's land, peace inside Greece. We're out. Thanks for hanging with us today. This podcast is all about creating deeper connections through our mutual love of music and the trumpet life. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast and also like and share this episode with a friend. We want to see the hang grow for show. Please support our sponsors and consider becoming a personal supporter of this podcast as well. Remember, for less than the price of a bottle of valve oil a month, you can keep this podcast moving smoothly. The Trumpet Guru's Hang is recorded at the Candy Factory, a co-working space and social club located in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Jose Johnson is the executive producer. Post-production editing is by Mitch Bowers. Our opening theme song was composed and performed by Lexi Signor. And our closing theme music comes courtesy of The Greatest Funeral Ever. Incidental music is by Ethan Swayze and Jose Johnson. Graphic design by Ann Kirby of the Sweet Corps. The Trumpet Guru's Hang podcast is produced in collaboration with the So Good Lancaster Media Group. Mm-hmm.